Hi, I'm Rebecca and today I will be doing a skincare routine on the channel of Bart. I convinced him to let me do this. So here we go. You just gently Nope, not on my channel, Fots. I have something else to show you today. And of course, it's going to be a moth. What I'm going to show you is indeed a moth, but not just a moth. It is one of the rarest silk moths in Central America, Antirea Godmani. So get hyped for this video. Welcome to another episode of Moth Cycles. In this video, I'm going to show you how to raise a legendary species. Anterea godmani is a legendary species of silk moth. First of all, it's beautiful. Second of all, it is somewhat rare. Third of all, it's not very easy to raise. What's interesting about the moth Anterea godmani is that the caterpillars seem to be huge. And I'm not exaggerating, they are monsters. One of the biggest caterpillars that I've ever seen. But uh, look at that monster here, wow, they're so, and they really eat a lot of leaf. They will eat as lot as you expect from a caterpillar this big. Amazing, just amazing, look at that. Let's get started, shall we? Hey there everyone and thanks for watching again today. Welcome to this episode of Moth Cycles. The video series where I show you the life cycles of moth species in captivity. Anterea godmani. It's somewhat of a rarity if we are talking about silk moths. Well, are you a silk moth lover? If you are, you've probably heard of the polyphemus moth. Anterea polyphemus. Species found in North America. But not many people know that the American continent has a few other species of Anterea, such as the Anterea oculea, which is encountered more in the th south, I believe around Arizona. But Central America also has two species, Anterea montezuma and Anterea godmani. Here I am holding a tube and it's filled with eggs and inside are the eggs of Anterea godmani. So I'm going to try and breed this rare moth and I hope I will be successful because that means you will get to enjoy the life cycle on camera which is a unique experience of course. But before we get started let's, let me tell you something about this species. Um, Anterea godmani is uh, found in Central America from Mexico to Panama to Honduras and even up to Costa Rica. So basically the central part uh, that connects north and south, the Central America, is where the species is found. Uh, it's somewhat of a more highland species, where it's found around the 1500 meter altitude, I believe. Um, its habitat is cloud forest, which means it will live in um, humid highlands in the tropics. Uh, now, typically these habitats during the day, they are hot and humid. Uh, but at night they can cool down and become actually 
cool to cold and humid because it's high altitude and uh, so you have hot warm days cooler nights and this is where the moth flies um, it's been taken well almost every season it appears to be almost uh, multivoltine it means it, it doesn't diapause or overwinter it's always breeding and the caterpillars feed on, feed on oak tree uh, it may surprise you that oak tree grows in the tropics but this is true but um, oak is more of a highland uh, type of tree uh, if we're talking about the tropics which explains why this moth flies on high altitude okay so let's get started okay first I have this tube of eggs and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna open it and put these eggs in a petri dish um, they will hatch in 10 to 14 days if I'm successful um, I will do nothing special I will just keep them on room temperature and uh, without any extra care now this is what I expect to happen um, when the eggs hatch I think uh, the most difficult part in breeding Anterea Godmani is that they have to accommodate. What I'm about to say now is going to sound weird to some of my viewers, but I have to say it anyways. This is what's going to happen when the eggs hatch. Some of the caterpillars are going to die quite soon. Now this part should be pretty obvious. This is uh, the eggs, the veal or the tube with eggs that I ordered online. So I'm gonna open it up by taking out some of the filler material. And this allows me to pop out the eggs quite easy. As you can see some are still stuck in the middle and we have to be careful because these are very precious eggs of a rare species and we don't want to spill it. There's one egg left here. Actually, there's two. There you go. And now we have all the eggs in the um, in the rearing container. Now, there's one thing I have to tell you. What's going to happen when these eggs hatch in uh, two weeks? Um, this is very usual for species like Anterea Godmani that um, are basically a bit rare and uh, more difficult to breed than average. Um, I expect some of the caterpillars to die quite soon. Now this may sound quite weird, but from my experience there's always um, a die-off if we are breeding this species. And the reason is because uh, these caterpillars are out of their comfort zone. To incubate the eggs of Andrea Godmanni you don't need to do anything special. Just keep them on room temperature for two weeks and don't do anything complicated that will make your life more difficult. Now you don't even need to spray them, although it can help, but it's easy to add too much water or too much heat. Room temperature and wait. So this is where I keep all my cocoons and eggs. I know it looks a bit messy, but here I have the Petri dish with eggs. I'm gonna put it inside. That's it. Just gonna wait two weeks. Yes, I know I have a messy room. Blah blah blah. It's not the point. I'll show you where I store the eggs. And now we wait. Good news everyone. Do you see these small wriggly worms here? And here? And here? Walking around in our egg container? These are the newborn caterpillars of our Anterea Godmani. That means since they've been born they need f uh, food as fast as possible and we are going to place them in their new home, their breeding container. First, we need a few things to truly get started. First of all, we need oak tree, okay? This is their only food. This species only wants to eat oak tree and nothing else. So this will be the food for the caterpillars. Second of all, 
I will bring a paper towel and a stick to scoop up the little caterpillars. Why and how? Usually I explain the basics and uh, my logic behind my actions with every video uh, called Moth Cycles. But this time I'm not going to. Because Anterea Godmani is a more rare species. It's a more advanced and difficult to breed species. So I assume the breeders that are watching this already know the basics. So I don't have to explain you everything. So first I pick, take the paper towel. I fold it up. So it can fit in my container. And here it will form a nice and soft bottom for the caterpillars to, while they are eating the leaves. It will also catch all their droppings and absorb excess moisture. Now I'm going to place the oak tree leaf in here. There we go. This should be enough food. There's more than enough food actually for them, but I'm going to change it every few days anyways to keep it fresh. Now I'm going to use the stick to scoop up the caterpillars and put them in the container. So I'm going to open this little container here and we are going to get started. Just use the stick to gently scoop these up. Very gently. As you can see they will stick to our little stick here. And gently, I try to rub them off. One uh, doesn't want to go. Ah, uh, there you go. Okay, so let's very gently scoop these up again with our stick. Come here, little one. Ah, uh, there you go. Try and put you here on this oak leaf. Rub very gently, don't crush it. Uh, there we go. There you go. Actually, the best way to do this, if you have it, is a paint brush. Because paint brushes are very soft and gentle. But it will still allow you to easily uh, rub the caterpillars off. Now the caterpillars are sitting on their food. So what we are going to do is we are going to close the lid of this box. And we are going to leave them alone and undisturbed for a few days. This is important. There you go. Let's lock it. And it's closed. Three days later. Today is a big day for our caterpillars. It's been four days since they hatched from their eggs. Uh, today we are going to do our first checkup to see how they are doing. <laughs> and how many survived. And how many didn't? Ah, looking good so far. Okay, so let's inspect this further. So far, all our caterpillars seem to be doing pretty damn good. Look at that. They're feeding quite nicely. It's turned bigger and a bit yellow. I don't think this is the second instar, but uh, they are close to shedding their skins to the second instar. Ah, beautiful. Um, when I started this video, I mentally prepared all of you for there to be uh, a big die-off. But looking at our container so far, I, I can't find any dead caterpillars. Here's one, but this one's alive. See? It's, it's uh, about to shed its skin even. So, uh, that's actually surprising. It really honestly surprises me. When uh, I breed Anterea Godmani, 
I'm very used to some of them perishing in uh, the first instar, it's uh, normal. But in this case, none of them have died so far, so to me this is extremely good news. It means that we have a high, potentially high survival rate. Very good, very good. See all these beautiful little uh, godmani here. It's exciting because this moth is a bit of a rarity, so people like me will get excited over the prospect of having many of them. So let's continue to the next step. Here are some caterpillar poop and uh, stuff, but nothing serious. <clears throat> okay, so our container is empty and clean. And the caterpillars need some fresh food, so I'm going to take a new paper towel. The old one uh, is dirty, so we, we replace this towel every time that we change the container. Okay. So here we have some fresh food. This is probably too much food. There's, uh, there's a thing as too much leaf in one container because um, leaves will also add moisture. And if you put too much leaves in one small container, it will become too wet. And this will grow problems like mold and bacteria. There you go, put this in here. So far this is the first instar. This is yet very easy, not much work. So um, now I see there's some bird poop on this leaf. So I'm gonna take that leaf off. Like bird shit can have parasites in it. So bye bye, we don't need you. Okay, put this here, this here. Now we have a new substrate for these caterpillars to be in here. Okay, so our container is empty and clean. And the caterpillars need some fresh food, so I'm gonna take a new paper towel. The old one uh, is dirty, so we, we replace this towel every time that we change the container. Okay. So here we have some fresh food. This is probably too much food. There's, uh, there's a thing as too much leaf in one container because um, leaves will also add moisture. And if you put too much leaves in one small container, it will become too wet. And this will grow problems like mold and bacteria. There you go, put this in here. So far this is the first instar, this is yet very easy, not much work. So um, now I see there's some bird poop on this leaf. So I'm gonna take that leaf off. Like bird shit can have parasites in it, so bye bye, we don't need you. Okay, put this here, this here. Now we have a new substrate for these caterpillars to be in here. Now, now our caterpillars are here on the leaf, but you don't want to pull them off because caterpillars have a really tight grip and if you rip them off, they will basically die so we're gonna want to prevent that so I've taken some scissors here and what we do is instead we cut the leaf where the caterpillars are sitting we cut the leaf around them so we can take them off it's very easy it's very basic but it's still important take here for example do you see the caterpillars here so use this The, be careful not to cut the caterpillars, of course. So here I have a twig in my hands with two caterpillars on it. This is what we need. This is how you handle them. You don't rip them off the leaf. Put that in here. And this is how and this is what we're gonna do for the entire batch here. For example, if we take a look here, we see some uh, see all these hot money. So, cut the leaf, very careful, don't hurt your... So here we have one caterpillar, see? One caterpillar goes in here. And that's basically what I'm gonna do now, until I've removed all the caterpillars of this. It may take some time, but uh, this is worth it. We wanna be careful with precious pieces like these. There you go. 
I think some of them are even shedding their skins right now and it's an extra reason not to move them. So yeah, well uh, let's skip through this part, you got the point. Looking good, right? So after removing all of the leaf, we are left with some caterpillars of the beautiful Anterea Godmani. Nice batch of them. So all of these gonna be in their new container. Boop. And we're we are going to continue the same thing. And uh, I think in the next uh, clip when we'll check back, they'll already be second instar. So uh, it's sunny outside. Summer is coming. So it's getting a bit warmer. That will make them grow even faster. Excellent, excellent. Looks like all, almost all of them are making it to the second instar. That's great. Okay, 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 okay. So now that I've shown you one time how I change the food plant and how I clean the containers, I don't need to show you the same thing over and over again. So we're going to go through it very quickly, just so you get an idea. Just change the paper towel every time, which will absorb the excess moisture and caterpillar poop and change the food plant. So they have a constant supply of fresh leaves. Not so difficult, right? Oh, and by the way, at one point I divided all the caterpillars from one rearing container into two rearing containers. Why is this? Well, when the caterpillars grow, they require more space and being overcrowded in a small box is never a good idea for a sensitive and rare species. So I divided them from one container into two containers. Otherwise, the basics are the same. And I kept doing this over and over until at one point the caterpillars became big enough for their own cage. Raising these caterpillars, at least for the first few instars, is quite straightforward. It's important to keep them in uh, containers that are not too wet or too dry. And that sounds a little bit weird, but they need to be um, in a controlled environment where not a, where not a much uh, evaporation is going on so that they cannot dry out but at the same time they don't have to be overly humid there has to be no condensation on the sides of the containers because uh, that will grow mold and fungi and diseases and will infect them now the caterpillars themselves like high humidity because this species comes from a cloud forest however there's also other things that like humidity and not just the caterpillars, and that is diseases. So in order to prevent diseases, don't spray them with water when they are in plastic boxes. Don't keep the containers wet, keep them relatively dry and use a, so an absorbing substrate such as vermiculite or paper towels like I do. And make sure you regularly change them because they need a high degree of hygiene. So what happens when the caterpillars are finally big enough? When they are outgrown the size and which is recommended to keep them in boxes. Well, I prefer to breed my caterpillars inside a rearing cage. These are specially tailored cages for caterpillars. And what I do is I put a bottle in there or a, a, a soda can filled with water. And in there I put a cutting of food plant which will keep it fresh and the caterpillars can free roam on here. So let's get started. They are going into the cage right now. Okay, what you're looking at in this little segment is me opening the plastic boxes which I used to raise the caterpillars so far, taking all the caterpillars out and putting them in a big cage. And in this cage there is a branch of oak tree inside a monster energy can filled with water. This will hydrate and moisturize the branch keeping the leaves fresh. And the caterpillars will just free roam on there and basically raise themselves without much of my interference. This is a very useful method for raising caterpillars. An empty box here. This is just for stability so the can will not fall over. The water inside the can will keep the, the food plant fresh for a few days. So you don't have to change it every day. And this will really work. Now then I take this and carefully put it inside their little cage here. 
This may be a tricky thing to do. Oop. Did the caterpillars grow well after I put them in a cage? Oh boy, yes they did. Eventually they grew to be quite big. And I counted my caterpillars every time and I counted about 12 healthy individuals. 12 caterpillars from 30 eggs is a very good rate, especially with a more difficult to rear species like Antreia Godmani. And these beautiful green pickles seem to be growing quite well. It's very straightforward to take care of them this way. All you have to do is just keep them on the food plant feeding for 3 to 5 days. And all you have to do is take out the food plant, get a new bottle full of water and change it. And eventually also change the branch that you use for food plant if they've eaten all the leaves or if it starts to become old and dry. Now it's also important to change the bottle with water once in a while. Because bacteria can grow in this water and the plant can absorb it. This is not good and may poison the caterpillars and make them sick. Keep, use a different bottle every week if you can and change the leaves every three to five days. And eventually you'll end up with some very beauty, beautiful, green, awesome little pickles called Antirea Godmani. There we go, this is our harvest for now. As you can see all of the caterpillars are getting big now and healthy. So it's really time to divide them up. I'm gonna put exactly half of them in each of these cages. So uh, hopefully they will appreciate the, um, the increase in size and space and food etc. Was the rearing easy so far? Yes it had been easy. I had about 12 awesome healthy caterpillars. They were growing so well, a little bit too well. You see the moth gods that exist in this universe. They don't allow me to have anything the easy way. So along the way something terrible happened. Disease. The caterpillars of Anterea Godmani are very sensitive to disease. And the symptoms are as follows. They will look very wet and sloppy. Or they will start to vomit or leak uh, body fluid such as blood or hemolymph and insects have diarrhea or start to vomit. This is terrible because when it happens the caterpillars can infect each other causing the whole brood of them to die. This is hard to prevent sometimes even if your conditions are perfect because the disease can be in your livestock from the very beginning and be triggered at a later stage when they grow big. So this can be very hard to prevent and the only way to prevent it is to take drastic measures. If you are a moth breeder it's very hard to overcome disease. Almost impossible even. But I managed to do it. How? By taking drastic measures and being relentless. I applied quarantine and did some drastic things. If you're wondering why I'm about to show you but you must promise me please don't get upset. What I'm about to show you is reality for a moth breeder. This caterpillar here has all symptoms of an infected and sick caterpillar and should be disposed of. First of all, it is barely moving and looks very lethargic. Second of all, its color is wrong. Healthy caterpillars of Anterea Godmani are a very bright, almost fluorescent lime green as you can see. This one is not. It is rather dark green. So, um, and when we poke this caterpillar it still responds to a stimuli. This may give us the impression that it's still alive. Uh, well, in fact it is still alive. But its chances of survival are essentially 0%. And as you can see it's also twitching a little which is unusual. It's making these twitching movements and overall it's just looking like it's infected or sick. Now the survival rate of caterpillars that have been infected by a virus is about 0%. Caterpillars almost never recover from this at all. Um, but the virus does not kill it right away because that would be pointless for the virus to do. 
Actually, the goal of a virus is not to kill a caterpillar. A goal of a virus is to spread to other organisms. So what is happening is the caterpillar will start to die slowly. It will start leaking body fluid. Um, this will give it like an almost wet impression, very glossy and wet, sweaty impression. Um, and this is the caterpillar basically bleeding to death very slowly. Now the virus does this on purpose because when a caterpillar contains a lot of moisture and when it's slowly uh, bleeding to death over the course of many days, then this moisture, which contains virus particles, can be allowed to spread in the environment. Now, if one very sickly looking caterpillar uh, starts bleeding or vomiting or, you know, or having diarrhea all over its uh, food plant and other caterpillars crawl inside this infected liquid, then they will also be infected. So um, this is not going to be a fun or wholesome part of the video. But after taking a close look at this individual here, I have decided it needs to be euthanized. Um, while some of you may say, hey Bart, why don't you give it a second chance and try to save its life? Uh, sorry, but it would do nothing but prolong its suffering in the first place, because as I've said, this type of virus is almost 100% lethal, certain death. And second of all, the slow dying process, wherein the caterpillar will slowly bleed to death, um, is a process that will allow it to contact other caterpillars and infect it. Now, I may, you may, in captivity it's possible to quarantine such individuals, but this makes no sense at all to me. Um, there's um, there's no chance of saving them and if you even if you do um, trying to save one individual is not worth endangering the lives of all the other caterpillars for and the longer that you keep sickly or weak or infected caterpillars alive the higher the chances are they will infect the rest of your brood um, these these diseases can spread very fast even if you breed them in separate rooms Virus particles can travel through the air, through your clothing, through everything. So, um, <clears throat> today we say goodbye to this individual. Still looking quite lively, still responding to stimuli, but I am 100% sure that this one is one carrying a pathogen. So here's what we do. We take Mr. Caterpillar here. We put him inside a plastic box, doesn't matter what box, close the lid <clears throat> and we say goodbye. Here is the freezer where I keep all my biological materials including dead moths and insects for research. Um, yeah, it's a bit over full as you can see. But um, this is freezing temperature. And what we will do is take the caterpillar, which is now inside this container, and place it inside the freezer. <coughs> there you go. Hope this hop. And that's it. So what will happen now is it will obviously freeze to death. I believe freezing is uh, for an insect a humane death. While it may be a painful experience to a vertebrate, insects are cold-blooded. So when the temperature is this low, what happens is uh, their body temperature goes down. And because insects are cold-blooded and need uh, heat from the environment, what happens is that basically their entire me metabolism just shuts down completely. It's like going into a coma. Then, when the moisture inside the caterpillar expands, because of the freezing temperatures, its cell structures are destroyed. And this is, in my opinion, a uh, humane death, effortless and fast. Secondly, it doesn't really matter what's humane or not. Insects don't feel pain. They are unable to suffer and don't feel any emotions. I will make another video about this subject. I don't want to discuss this. This video is about breeding, Anterea got money and nothing else. Not the discussion of pain in insects. And you have to be relentless on these 
types of individuals because Anterea godmani is an extraordinarily sensitive species. You don't want to risk infecting all your caterpillars because of one sick one. When you see something that looks odd, discolored or sweating or wet, you need to kill it immediately and viciously. Don't hold back because you have an emotional attachment to your pets. Don't hold back because you hate to kill them or because you think it's inhumane. Whenever you see something that looks sickly or weak, kill, 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 kill it now to protect your other healthy stock. That's it. Okay, you may hate me for doing that. You may hate me for showing that. But that's the reality of the situation. And did I defeat the disease? Yes, I did. My caterpillar survived because I killed all these sick looking individuals. Now, and let's be honest, insect rights activists are out of their mind and wouldn't ever understand biology anyways. What have those people ever contributed to the knowledge of our ecosystem? Zero. Let's continue. Massive. Eventually the caterpillars became massive. After I defeated the virus that killed some of my caterpillars, they reached the final instar. And the final instar is something to be an all about. These caterpillars are one of the biggest Saturnid caterpillars I've raised so far. And their caterpillar weight was up to 21 grams, but a friend of mine reared caterpillars up to 28 grams, so they can be even bigger. Wow, amazing! I wonder how it's possible for these creatures to get so fat. It's really amazing to think about. I guess that's what happens if you keep eating all day. Um, so I just kept doing the same thing over and over, giving them fresh leaf, giving them fresh containers, changing the cages, blah 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 blah. You get the point, right? I mean, if you are out there breeding this species, you probably have the basic experience because this is a species for more advanced moth breeders. But um, if you follow the basics, they are not so extremely difficult, just a very sensitive species. And you have to be able to cope with diseases and other problems that you may face. Sorry for that disturbing fragment and the salty commentary I just added. but. Let's be honest, the people who complain about insects rights and welfare are usually the most stupid ones who know the least about animals while well, they claim to know a lot about biology. But in reality, they've never really read any book or ever studied something related to ecology. So I just wanted to show you what it's really like to be a moth breeder. Sometimes you get very difficult challenges like this. And I also want to show those on YouTube. And if I hadn't quarantined uh, these caterpillars, probably all of them would have died because of the disease. So, anyways, these giant caterpillars take about two months to reach this full size. And when they do, you will be so extremely impressed by them. It's incredible. Now, one thing that surprised me about the species Anterea godmani is how big their caterpillars are. And I'm not exaggerating when I say they are huge. They are colossal. This is seriously one of the biggest caterpillars that I've ever seen. And when I got the eggs from this moth, my friends did tell me that they were going to be bigger than uh, its cousins in North America. In North America you have a very similar moth species that's very common, called a polyphemus moth, uh, Anterea polyphemus. And yes, I've been told that they, these were going to be a little bit bigger than uh, the polyphemus moth, but turns out that a little bit bigger is actually a massive understatement because they are colossal. It's definitely one of the biggest caterpillars that I have seen so far, probably including uh, Citeronia Azteca and uh, Gonometa Nisa, the leopard moth from Africa that we've seen on my channel before. They were also huge. But uh, look at that monster here, wow, they're so, and they really eat a lot of leaf. They will eat as lot as you expect from a caterpillar this big. Amazing.
just amazing. Look at that. And then, one day, it finally happened. The caterpillar started spinning cocoons. First, they will start to spin almost invisible small white threads. And inside this cocoon, they will keep spinning and spinning for hours until eventually the cocoon is entirely enveloped and turns thick and brown. The spinning of these cocoons takes a while and they prefer to do it in the corners of a cage or in leaf litter or even against the branches of the food plant. Either way I was happy and relieved to finally see cocoons because I put a lot of time and effort in this episode. This is one of the first times I'm making such a big YouTube video and I really want it to be good. Now imagine what would happen if my project would fail. Then my video would also fail and I had to film everything all over again. So this was what added a lot of extra pressure for me but luckily it paid off. Hey guys, do you want to know how my breeding of moths is going today? What? No? You don't want to see it? Dude, go watch that creepy sociopath Onision or something, or Jake Paul. Like, watch him make fun of dead people in the forest. Okay, this is not a channel for you. Bye. Nah, just kidding. <laughs> oh, Bart, you so quirky. Oh, it's so nice. It's so silly and relatable when a creature like me tries to do attempts at humor on YouTube. Let's stick to what I'm good at. Selling, telling you very monotone monologues about insects like the robot that I am. I'm basically an advanced version of Cleverbot. Anyway, um, today we're gonna do a little status update. Ooh, this is some annoying camera reflection. So let's, there we go, let's backlight. Oh, hey, see the table behind me? Well, turns out that here are some of the remaining caterpillars on this uh, oak tree and some of the cocoons. So we may want to check that out. See how is uh, Andrea got money doing. So let me pick you up there. Are you alright? Whoop! Almost dropped you there. So funny. Okay, let's take a look. Let us take a look at our current moth breeding status. Aha! Organism detected. Scientific name. Antheria got money. Classification Lepidoptera. Threat level no threat. So what we have here is the first cocoons of the Antheria got money. Dun 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 dun. -dun. How do you pronounce got money? Is like got money or got money? I don't know. Tell me in the comments. So these are our first cocoons of this uh, beautiful, awesome, and rare species. As you can see, it's one, two, three, four, five. Ma, not bad, I say. But we are not finished. We are almost finished though. Because here we have some juicy oak leaves. And on the oak leaves you can find some caterpillars. See? It's not easy to spot them since their camouflage is just excellent. But um, there are some of the caterpillars that we have left. So count with me here. This is one. Aha. Uh -huh. This guy here. Yeah, I see you. You see you. Boop. This is number two. Right. So now that you've seen caterpillar number one and two, say hi to Mr. Number Three. Caterpillar number three, shout out to you. Give us your link and we'll subscribe to your channel. Caterpillar number three, you're the funniest one out of all four. Oh just I just spoiled how many I have. But uh, like I said, in total I have four left. So uh, here is Mr. Or I think this is Mrs. because of her size. This is Mrs. Uh, Godmani number four. So... Now as you know, a very intellectual guy like me has a very intellectual audience. And some of you will be familiar with what we call basic moths. So there we have five cocoons and four caterpillars. That makes five plus four is nine. Potentially nine moths. But wait, there's one surprise I didn't tell you yet. Dun dun dun. 
Hidden in the oak leaves. Oh yes, hidden in the oak leaves. There's one fresh cocoon. Now this is professional silk farming. So probably gonna harvest this one, but uh, I don't know, I'm not sure how. But uh, I'll, I'll, I'll take it off when I'm uh, not filming. Anyways, four caterpillars plus, well, six cocoons is, uh, wait, did I really have trouble counting? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Um, what? Okay, it's ten. Please tell me it's ten. I'm going to be so embarrassed if I'm wrong. Anyway, um, all right, so I pull this thingy here straight out of the tree. There you go. One cocoon, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. So potentially eleven moths. My god, I was wrong. And I was acting so smug about calculus. I mean calculus, I mean moths. So uh, potentially we have eleven moths, assuming that all of these caterpillars are going to make it, which I sincerely hope, but they say never count your chickens before they hatched. So uh, I'm going to answer you the question, is this a good result? Well, we had about 30 eggs, so uh, if you think about it, if we really get 11 cocoons out of about 30 eggs, it's not bad. Although, as you've seen in this video, we did have some severe losses with diseases and viruses. So uh, a part of me feels like some of these infections could have been preventable, I don't know. Um, if if somehow I was able to save these caterpillars or prevent them from getting sick, I would have had way more. I would have had like 20 cocoons or more. So uh, it really sucks that some of them just decided to drop like flies and explode into caterpillar Ebola. Really sad, but you know, that's part of this hobby. I don't know any breeder who can prevent this with 100% certainty. So... Uh, guess it was my bad day but it was a really good idea of mine to quarantine some of them which is one of the reasons that some of them are still alive and cocooning if i didn't quarantine them all of them would have died probably so uh, yeah <clears throat> i would say it's a reasonable result although you have to relativize it i mean this is a difficult to, to rear species to be honest uh, more difficult than most antereas and uh, yeah you know if you tell a collector that you raised 11 Antirea Godmanis, well, I'll tell you, he'll start drooling from his mouth. Because uh, it's a rarity, it's not, not commonly bred. So uh, I guess I'll just take what be, I'll just have to learn to be happy with what I have and not with what I don't have. So, uh, <clears throat> anyways, this video is not finished. We have some larva left to rear. Look at that, these. These caterpillars are so amazing. I mean, I'm pretty sure the moths are just as amazing, amazing, but these caterpillars, I really love their shape and they're really lime green color, guys. I'm also really tired right now. You don't, you wouldn't believe me, but um, it's actually about four o'clock at night. Okay, boys and girls, the first cocoons of hot money are here. Here you can see fresh batch. Got a handful of them. There's about uh, eight cocoons now. Uh, some caterpillars are still spinning up. What you want to do is, yeah, yeah, let's switch a little. Ah, there you go. Moth cage, yay. What you want to do is you want to put the cocoons in there. Boom. And forget about them for a while. This species should be continuously brooding, brooded, so that means you'll usually get to see them hatch in one or two months time however there are cases that this species can hibernate actually it's not hibernation since in the tropics there is no true winter it's more often estivation or some kind of diapause that allows them to survive the driest uh, seasons in central america so they do have a biological ability to Overwinter, which is not overwintering at all. It's basically over dry seasoning. Yeah, that's a whole mouthful. Also, sorry for sweating like this. 
there is a heat wave in the Netherlands. Yes, that's right. In fact, I'm making several Moss Cycles video at the same time right now. And in each of them, I've mentioned the heat wave. So when the Polyphemus video is coming out, you'll see me complain about the heat wave. When the uh, God Money video is coming out, you'll see me complain about the heat wave. When the Altamiris video and some others that I'm preparing are coming out, you'll see me complain about the heat wave. Anyway, there's a heat wave. Did you know? So this is basically a waiting game. Cocoons should be very easy. Room temperature, make sure to spray them a little bit, keep them humid, they will love it. Now this cocoon is certainly alive and healthy. Can you see it vibrate a little? My hand is not doing it, it's just the pupa inside basically protesting being handled. What's interesting is they, they vibrate in this very rhythmical way. It's like zzz, zzz. See? It's in small bursts. Very interesting. This is a good sign if the pupa is wriggling wildly, the animal is very lively. You shouldn't do this too much because they'll exhaust themselves before they hatch. They only have limited energy inside this cocoon, but to do it once it's okay. It's basically a vitality check. And just look at these ridiculously long appendages. This is really something funny. All my cocoons have this. Um, let's see. Take this one for example. See? This seems to be a typical uh, Antarea God Money thing. Other Antareas can have this appendage as well, just not this ridiculously long. Crazy. Anyway, waiting game. Uh, we can do nothing right now except for keeping these guys warm, humid and waiting for them to hatch soon. Now, I'm not a big fan of opening up cocoons. But I did it one time to show you the pupa. This is the pupa of Anterea Godmani. It appears to be somewhat black with very large antenna. This is a male. Uh, it's alive. I don't know if it's very healthy. This was the only cocoon that wasn't moving a lot. So that's why I opened it to check up if it was healthy or not. It seems alive, but I don't know if this will make it. Anyway, now you can see what the pupa looks like. It very much reminds me of Hyalophora. Uh-oh, the big reveal is happening soon. But first we're going to do a little recap. Do you remember all the life stages we've been through? Eggs. Instar number one. Yes, this small white thingy with a red head capsule. Instar number two, this lime fluorescent green caterpillar right here. Instar number three, basically a small green worm. Instar number four, basically a bigger green worm. Instar number five, basically a giant monster colossus Godzilla tier level giant green worm. Cocoons and pupa, which take a few months. But then, if you've been through all these life stages, oh yes. Hello everyone. Um, currently it's two o'clock in the middle of the night. It's still very warm in the Netherlands. I was about to go to bed. Because I have to work tomorrow. But then I heard a crackling noise in my room. So it's like... And I take a look, and this is what I found. Let's see if my camera will actually focus on it. This is an Anterea Godmani. I know it looks kind of weird, but it just hatched from its cocoons. That means that its wings are not yet completed. So I have to be careful with this one, not to disturb it. It will inflate its wings in about an hour time, I suppose. I have to be really careful not to drop it or disturb it. I put it here on this little stick. And this is great news because this means 
Our project is almost finished and so is this episode of Moth Cycles. Um, I don't know if I'm going to be able to pair them. I don't have many cocoons. I have like seven cocoons. That's not a whole lot. There is a chance of pairings, but a small one. Anyway, the point of Moth Cycles is not pairing. The point of this video is to show the life cycle from egg to adult. That's it. That's everything I wanted. So if they pair, it's a good bonus, but it's not what I need. Um, judging by the antenna, this is a male. It's going to be a beautiful male, but I have to leave it alone for a while because it has to inflate the wings in peace without my voice bothering it too much and my handling it. So let's check back in about 30 minutes and see what happens. <laughs> It's so beautiful. I can't believe this. Wow. Wow. What an amazing species, guys. It's just a beautiful rarity. Honestly. I'm so euphoric. It's so big. Look at that size. Dude, this is like twice the size of a polyphemus moth. I'm not kidding you right now. So incredibly amazing. I should be careful, it's still very fresh and his wings are very soft right now. Wow, let's take this one a little bit to the light here. Wow, amazing. I can't believe it. So incredible. I love this hobby, I love this so much. Today I am really, really, really excited because here in my hand I am holding a male specimen of Anterea Godmani. I raised these guys myself from egg to adult moth and their beauty has really taken me by surprise. Just look at that amazing brown-orange color and those awesome eye spots on the hind wings, not to mention its shape and huge size. Now some of you may think that this species looks familiar and that's true uh, because this species is a relative of the North American polyphemus moth, uh, Anterea polyphemus. Although it's much bigger, it's almost twice the size of a polyphemus moth in fact. Um, in America there are four species of Anterea and of course the most famous one is the polyphemus moth, Anterea polyphemus. I think most Americans uh, know that species. Uh, then in the south you have Anterea oculea. It's a different species it's, but it kind of looks like polyphemus. Then in Central America around Mexico you have the Anterea montezuma. It looks like a polyphemus moth with, with this strange uh, scalloped edge. And finally in places like Costa Rica you have Anterea godmani. This is the one I'm holding now. 
and it's so incredibly big it's unbelievable how big this moth is wow look at its size it's like almost like an atlas moth seriously i'm not kidding you uh, one of the bigger species of anterea that i've seen maybe some of you guys will appreciate seeing some details here just look at that it's so marvelous so marvelous The behavior of this insect is very wild and it is very easy to scare it off by making a too big movement. But uh, this one is freshly hatched, it hatched last night. So I'm glad that I'm still able to show you an almost perfect specimen. Uh, breeding these was not very easy. The easiest thing about them is their food plant which is oak tree Quercus. Um, if you live in Europe or America, this stuff grows just about everywhere. So that's the good news. The bad news is they can be very sensitive to infection and diseases. But it's very possible to breed them if you keep them in low densities. Don't put too many together in one cage. And I guess you'll be fine. Thanks for watching everyone. I'm really happy that, this is, uh, that we could cross off a hallmark species of my YouTube channel. The, this Anterea Godmani here is one of the legendary species of silk moth that, you know, every breeder has to breed once in his life, in my opinion. And showing it on my YouTube channel is an achievement. I want it for a while. Oops. It's, uh, I don't know what's doing, but I don't trust it. I hope it's not going to fly away. Hello everyone. It's middle of the night. It's four o'clock. And I heard some rustling, some rustling noises. And I was like, what the heck is that? Turns out it's the first female of Anterea Godmani hatching here right in front of my eyes. And she is beautiful, perfect. This is so amazing. There's also some bad news. The male that you saw in the previous fragment, he died. Because um, I think I filmed that about three weeks ago. Uh, for some reason they're emerging a little bit sporadically. Um, I expected all of the moths to hatch at the same time. But they are definitely for some reason hatching weeks apart. Which sucks because they only live for a short time and it's not really possible to get a pairing. If they keep doing that. Mm -hmm. Either way. We are going to leave her alone. To inflate her wings in peace and I guess we'll come back tomorrow to take a look at this amazing specimen wow hello everyone and this is Bart and today I look really really terrible that's because I just came out of the shower don't worry okay I only shower one time per year so it won't happen again now please give me some privacy what's wrong with you people and I was really really rushing because um, I just came from work and it's already late uh, in a few hours it will be dark and I still wanted to show you the Anterea Godmani female And eventually, more moths did indeed hatch from their cocoons. I had quite a few males and quite a few females. What's interesting about this piece is that the males are bigger than the females. Now for a moth that's very unusual, because in almost all species of Lepidoptera, the females are bigger than the males. But I guess the roles are reversed in this species for some reason. And the moths were really, really beautiful to see. Um, but I did have one problem and that's the fact that well I couldn't get a male and a female out at the same time from their cocoons. You see every time one moth hatched it took two weeks for the next moth to hatch and that's annoying because these moths only live for two weeks so I never had a male and female at the same time which was annoying and because of that I didn't get a pairing. So when it comes from rearing this beautiful moth from egg to adult, 
I consider it to be a success. However, I was not able to pair them. Why? Well, I never got a male and a female at the same time. The problem is that these moths, they only live for about two weeks. So that means if a male and a female hatch about three weeks apart, they are never even going to meet each other. Um, I had a little bit of bad luck too. Um, I had more females than males. So um, at one point I had several females at the same time. If these uh, gender ratios would have been different, I would have been able to pair them. But that's not always the case, because this hobby can be a little bit like the lottery. You don't just need to have skill, you also need to have good luck. And this time I just wasn't lucky. Um, I think I would have been able to pair them if I simply had more cocoons. Because if you only have 8 cocoons, the chances of having a male and female out at the same time can be a little bit rare. It can happen though, but to maximize your chances you're probably going to need more cocoons. However, this is a very rare species and also a very expensive one. So uh, I did not want to order uh, like a thousand eggs immediately. Because it's more difficult and stressful to have success with so many at the same time. I only wanted to raise a few for YouTube. So the next time I'm going to breed them, I'm going to try a higher number of them. And I'm pretty sure that if I do, I will be able to pair them. Oops. Uh, I must say I have paired these pieces in the past before because um, a friend once sent me cocoons of this moth. It's like in 2017, many years ago. And the animals hatched and I paired them. But um, when that happened, I failed to raise the caterpillars. So this is my rematch. And I was able to raise the caterpillars, but not pair the moth. So uh, I am satisfied though, I am happy because the point of this video was not to breed them. The point was just to raise them from egg to adult. That is my hobby and pairing is just a bonus. But I consider the project to be a success when I can produce several adults from eggs. And um, for me, this is a win in my book. And eggs are just an extra. Because uh, I don't want to breed the same species all over again always anyway. So it would have been nice. But hey, it's not always necessary. So thank you. Did I really care about that? Mm, not so much. It was really enjoyable to rear them. And pairing them sometimes is like a gamble. You need a little bit of luck. Especially when it comes to short-lived animals. The only way to increase your chances is to breed more of them. So I guess that next time... I would try to raise them in higher numbers, but it was still quite interesting to see them. Sadly, these moths will destroy themselves completely. If left in a cage alone, they will flutter against the cage wall so much that their wings will shred or even break in some cases, which looks rather silly. But I guess that's one of the risks that comes with breeding a Saturnid that's so active like this one. last cocoon just hatched and just oof and that beautiful male <laughs> just hatched from it hey dude will you come back you're on a video my man yes Ooh. yeah I think he's a little camera shy but um I'd say the breeding was uh, a huge success. Of course, I am always successful. Except for one thing, I really would have liked to pair them. And here I have the last female that hatched uh, two weeks ago. As you can see, she is dead. This is her dead dried specimen. And... Um, seriously, guys. Okay. Um, that should go in the bloopers. Or you know what, I'm just going to keep it for the main video. Just have that little cute unprofessionalism in there. That's so genuine and awesome. Oh, Bart is a genuine person and nothing is scripted. 
anyway this is the female she is obviously as dead as she can be and that's a problem with moths that live for a short time because uh, if they if they hatch far far apart from each other yep yikes if they um, hatch a long time from each other then the uh, males and females will have already died by the time a second one hatches so uh, it's very hard to influence that people have told me that uh, this species should be very synchronized in captivity and that all of them will be hatched at the same time uh, unfortunately for me this was not the truth um, it seemed almost um, like someone was trolling me on purpose because every time a new specimen hatched it was about one or two days after the previous moth died so uh, yeah but uh, I think it just is just a numbers game and um, I'm confident that I can raise them now in captivity I've done it I've succeeded and uh, the next time I will just try again but with a bigger number of eggs now if I'm ever going to get eggs again I don't know because uh, this is actually a true rarity it's perhaps one of the rarest moths uh, that I've shown on my channel before. Okay, that's maybe a bit extreme, but uh, it is not something uh, that you will easily find. It's a collector's item. The moths are quite valuable. So uh, if you are a collector, I don't kill them for collection, but if you do, these would be quite valuable uh, specimens. So uh, thanks for watching. Oh, that's true. I have to give myself a rating. Well, I think the way I dealt with disease was very good because it's very difficult to beat disease and most of the time if your caterpillars become sick all of them will die but they didn't because of my brilliant mind <clears throat> no just kidding but that's a good thing if i had to give myself a rating i'd give myself a six out of ten because there was no pairing there was losses many died from disease so that's two big negative points However, it's still difficult to raise species, at least for me. Okay, I know some people in the comments, oh, but I read Kamani is so easy. Okay, dude, there's no way, there's no use in arguing that. There's no, no such thing as inherent objective difficulty. What is difficult for me can be easy for you. Depends on your conditions, your experience, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, you get the point. <clears throat> I am happy I managed to raise some on YouTube of all things, it's a rare species, so uh, yeah, 6 out of 10. By the way, are you interested in seeing some bloopers? Check this out. Free rearing of a... Uh, After a few weeks of being in this cage, did this... Ja. Nee. Silly, huh? Okay. Now we will move on to the next part, the pathetic part, the e-bagging, which is part of this series. Alright guys, welcome to the e-bagging part of my video, it's my least favorite part, I don't like doing it, um, it feels a little bit shameless, almost like a beggar or a street artist, but here's the truth, um, I have pretty busy life, I am a student, I study biology, by chance my study book happens to be here, see this? I gotta know all of this from the top of my head because um, I'm 26 years old and I'm still a student. I'm a very late student. So um, <clears throat> here's another of my ecology books. See, very fascinating, very interesting. 
but it takes a lot a lot of time and energy now there's also other things I do I work multiple jobs at the same time uh, I work in a scientific insect collection of course there is YouTube also it takes a lot of time there is breeding insects which is my hobby that I take a little bit too seriously uh, I am the consultant of a butterfly farm I am a freelance entomologist um, I bring moths and butterflies for TV commercials also um, that's one of the things that I seriously do in fact I'm even helping on a few TV shows you'll you'll see about that later in the future it's, it's not a joke anyway uh, my life is going well it's pretty good but here's the thing I don't really have the time to make hour-long YouTube videos like the one that you just watched today and you may be surprised because I just said I don't have the time to make them but still I made one and that's because this episode was essentially paid for um, I have a few sponsors in my life which I'm really grateful for which uh, basically uh, provide me with tips because they like my videos they like my website they like they like my content and this allows me, yes, this allows me to stop working for a few days per week and film. And I will go out there in the wild with my camera in the forest. I'm making a few documentaries, but also things like Moth Cycles episodes. Um, and I need this because my YouTube channel is demonetized. For some reason, I'm not being supported by YouTube. If people click on my videos, I don't make anything. And do I need money for this? No, no, I don't need money. In fact, I've been a YouTuber for about five or six years and it didn't get me anything um, up until last year when my channel suddenly got really popular. So I will be on YouTube if I don't get paid for it anyways. But if I do get paid for it, the things I will make are just... It's very simple. The things I make will be much better. Much better. Because I will have free time. I, will have, I can stop working to film, which is very good. Um, I can also, you know, use the budget to buy interesting species and equipment to do experiments, to breed more rare and unique species and maybe even to travel in the future. I don't expect you to pay for me in my life. I have a job. Uh, financially, I'm doing okay for a 26 year old. I'm not rich, but, um, you know, I, I pay my bills. I can. I have food in the morning, that's important. Uh, it's important to have food, to have a bed, to have a place to sleep. I have the basics. But, you know, making hour-long YouTube videos is a little bit beyond that. That's really something that takes an extreme amount of time and effort with almost zero gain, except for being happy about it. So, my incentive for doing this is not financial. Um, I will be here, your trusty online entomologist, always. <laughs> but if you can help me out, that would be great. And I would ask you to consider it. I have one crowdfunding platform called Patreon. It's in the comments or uh, in the description too of this video. There's also several other links that you can click and uh, see how to contribute. And if you can't, then I completely understand. Because uh, I don't think I've ever donated anything in my life. Uh, which may be hypocritical since I'm asking for donations, but I'm just not in a financial situation to uh, to give. And I understand some of you maybe too. So if you are one of the viewers that's not able to, I want you to know I really like the fact that you watch my video. I feel honored. I really like the fact that you are watching this right now. It's amazing to make so many friends online, to meet so many people in real life. Um, YouTube has really been changing my life lately and I'm really, really, really grateful for that. So, hey, even if you don't want to or, or even if you cannot contribute, it's completely okay, man. Thank you for watching. Thank you for subscribing. But if you are in a position to do so, please consider it. And not because I need the money or because I'm poor, but because you like my content. It's just like buying a subscription to a magazine you like to read. It's just like buying a subscription to Netflix to watch your favorite series. It's the same thing if you like the stuff that I do, then subscribe and consider crowdfunding me. And if you do, it will also help me make more. 
because the quality of this is only going up in the future. I will be getting new cameras, I will be getting new editing equipment. At some point maybe I can even travel to collect the rarest moths to film them for you. Imagine your favorite species on YouTube. So uh, this was your favorite freelance entomologist for today. So uh, doing the e-bagging part, which is a sad but obligatory part of my videos. Uh, other YouTubers don't have to do this because uh, they make ad revenue and I don't. I don't get anything in return, in principle. That being said, I'm working on a few documentaries behind the scenes. And some of them take two years to make and I'm really doing my best. I uh, hope that they will be a big success and bring me a lot of views. And um, to show you that I'm not bluffing, I'm going to end this video with a preview. And that's basically a comp compilation with some nice music on the background, copyright free music. And um, basically all the images I will use are unused images for my future series and documentaries. So just to give you a little sneak peek. Thank you for watching and I hope to see you next episode of Moth Cycles. Hey.